Okay, good evening. We're glad you're here. We are uh, thankful uh, tonight to, to be able to have a, a special program, and uh, we're, we're going to introduce that in just a moment. Just a, uh, a couple things as, as we get going here. Uh, first of all, I want to welcome those that, that are watching online. We're glad you joined us uh, as well. And uh, we're thankful and uh, want you to know just a, a few things for our church family uh, as far as some health issues uh, going on. Uh, continue to pray for Gary Litke. Uh, as, as he's been in the hospital. Uh, also, Jim Key is uh, recovering and, uh, and, and recovering at home. Uh, Jim mentioned to me that he, uh, uh, he, he's been kind of laid up so long having to watch TV that he knows how the commercials end before they get started. So, uh, but he, he's got a little while longer to go. But uh, remember Gary and, and Jim. And then uh, also uh, want you to know that uh, Shauna uh, Stabler's mother passed away in Chickasha. Uh, today, and uh, and we want to uh, remember Shauna and and her family uh, as well. Okay, uh, we're going to begin with a word of prayer, and then I'm going to turn it over to Robert uh, Pettit, who was key and instrumental in uh, in us knowing and, and being able to to line up uh, tonight's uh, program, and he's going to introduce uh, our uh, speaker of the evening. So let's pray together and we'll begin. Father, we thank you for a time to gather as, as your family. And Father, we remember those that uh, are dealing with and Jim, we just pray for their recovery. Uh, Father, uh, also for those that are dealing with losses. Um, like Shauna and her family, and we just ask your blessings on them. Father, we thank you for creating this marvelous world for us and just here tonight and thank you and just bless this time uh, that we have together together. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Robert? So I don't want to take a lot of Ryan's time, but our speaker tonight is Ryan Cox. He works for Creation Truth Foundation. He's been doing this for about four years. Country, they uh, do these presentations, usually a little longer than one night. Uh, they'll do week-long uh, camps and, and uh, Bible, you know, Bible revivals, that type of thing. And uh, he, he goes around full-time strengthening and encouraging people uh, with the accuracy of the Bible and how it, uh, how it syncs up with the things that sometimes we're told uh, don't agree with what we're Give him as much as he can, uh, can use. Yes, yeah, that's right. Good evening, church. Oh, it is good to be with you. Uh, a tremendous blessing because uh, you're local. And so for us, we're based out of Noble, Oklahoma, just over in Noble. So, I mean, this was uh, this is in our backyard. I get to sleep on my own bed tonight. So thank you very much. Our, our rig of fossils actually heads out very early tomorrow morning. We have an even bigger 40-something um, foot trailer full of dinosaur fossils heading to uh, Wyoming for two weeks. And so uh, we do this full time. It is a blessing to get to be a part of this. And we very much uh, tonight are wanting to impact your worldview, your worldview, how you see the world. How you, what lenses you use, how you go about looking at people, events, Dinosaurs. Most importantly, this book. And how do you view that? 
What are your thoughts about this? How much of your life? during Sunday school time, and then that's it? Or is it life-changing, life-guiding? Is it what we go to as our foundation for everything or not? And so in order to do that tonight, I'm going to answer a question. Young people, okay? And then I'm going to ask you a question, then we're going to go from there, okay? So let me answer the very first question that every young person in here has right now. As soon as they walk in here, they come up and they go, are those real? Okay? And the answer to that question, if you were to ask me if those are real or fake, if you were to ask me if it is a real or replica fossil, the answer to that is yes. It depends on which one you're talking about. Some of these are the actual hard rock fossils dug dr straight up out of the ground and uh, get to be a part of our collection here. The rest of them, if they were the actual rock fossil, what's a fossil? It's a, it's a, you, you can speak, it's okay. It's, it's a rock. How, is a rock heavy or light? It's heavy. That's right. In fact, let, let, let's, let's look at one here. Uh, let's go with this one right here. Okay, let's take a look at this one right here. Okay, is this heavy or light? What do you think? Is that, is that heavy or light? This is an actual real rock fossil. Oh, my goodness. As heavy, that's right. Oh, did you want to see it over there? Yeah, did you see it? Is it soft or hard? Whoa, that's heavy. Oh, she goes, whoa, that's heavy. Look out. That's right. Okay, is it, what do you guys think? I mean, this little thing right here, it is only, you see how heavy that is? Oh, my goodness, about weighed them down. It's like a boat anchor. Goodness sakes, what do you think? Is that, yeah? Did you want to see it? Yeah, come here, come here real quick. Oh, that's heavy, isn't it? Do you know what that is? It's called coprolite. Can you say coprolite? Do you know what coprolite is? That's fossilized dino poo poo. She just, <laughs> she did. You're cool with that, aren't you? <laughs> Ain't that good? You're like, let me see it. Yeah. All the guys are like, oh, let me have you. you know. All right. Now, that's, a, now, I don't, what's a fossil? It's a rock. It's gone through a process that the original biomaterial has been replaced. Realization. It is very heavy, isn't it? Okay, and so all these minerals, and it's turned it into rock. You can see how it's been agatized over here and all this guys. And so can you imagine then just how heavy that little piece is if this guy was solid rock? We'd need a forklift to get it in here, wouldn't we? Not to mention, what would happen if I dropped this? It would, it would shatter, it'd break, wouldn't it? Crumble a bunch of pieces. So they are very fragile as well. Dig up the original ones, like this guy right here. Okay, let's talk about Stan the T-Rex real quick. I haven't gotten to any of my slides yet. We're just having fun with fossils. Here we go. So we got Stan the T-Rex here. When Stan was dug up, 1987, in Harding County, South Dakota, um, they could not believe what they had found. At the time, it measured to be about the biggest T-Rex ever ever discovered. Sue would be later discovered. She'd end up being a little bigger than him. But this T-Rex is going to be about 40 feet long, about 13 feet tall at the hips. You measure dinosaurs at the hips. You see why. See my friend Pebbles up here. Everybody say hi, Pebbles. Pebbles there is an Albertosaurus. When they originally discovered the Albertosaurus up in Alberta, Canada. They first thought it was a juvenile T-Rex uh, because of how it looked. Well, then they finally started, eh, it's a little bit different, not quite the same, okay. It's back to Stan, when they found this guy, he had the most beautifully preserved and most complete skull of any T-Rex ever found. It was incredible. Just the most amazing. So everybody wanted to see Stan. See, a lot of like Sue, when they discovered her, her head was completely crushed and under her pelvis. Like something catastrophic had happened 
when she was buried with, but by the way, you know how you make a fossil? See, if, if this material would have been left out on the road, like roadkill, what happens to that over time? Does it turn into a fossil? No, what happens to it? It's, it goes away through lots of different reasons. So in order for something to be preserved and turned into a fossil, it has to be buried with lots of, here's how we teach the kids in BBS and church camp, okay? Everybody do this. Everybody take your hands like this. In order to make a fossil, you need lots of mud, say mud, mud, brought by lots of water, say water, water, very quickly, okay? So to make a fossil, something that was once alive or was from something once alive has to be buried with lots of, brought by lots of, very, so that it's preserved and then can go through the fossilization. That water's bringing in the minerals that eventually dissolve away the original biomaterial and replaces it. They find Stan. It's the most complete, intact skull ever discovered. Guess what everybody wants to see? Stan. It's named after Stan Sackerson, the guy who found it. So, its catalog number is BHI 3033, the Black Hills Institute of South Dakota. Well, that's fine if you can go to South Dakota and look at it and study it. But every university, laboratory, natural history museum wants a Stan. So what these guys do, all these, r all these guys up here that you see here, the people who dig them up, either them or somebody they work very closely with, then as a profession will make a first-generation research replica from that actual fossil to such a detail that every little, little nook and cranny, little scratch and everything, every little tooth mark hole where he got bit, he's got a lot of bite marks here, he's had a rough life, Stan apparently did, is to such detail, you can actually put this in to an MRI machine and get the exact same scan as you would if you had the real one. It's a research level replica. So that's what you see up here, and that is what we are so blessed to have as a mobile museum. And I got some other things I can show you later about that if you come up afterwards. So we're very, very blessed to have these guys in here. And that is what you will see in the vast majority of museums you go to are first generation casts from the actual one, the research level replicas. If you go up to Sam Noble Museum at OU, the vast majority of those are research-level replicas. The Pentaceratops is an incredible, it, has, it is the Guinness World Record largest land animal skull ever discovered of any animal. So you need to go see it. It's phenomenal. And they got all these signs and everything pointing to it. This one's real. This one's real. You know? Here's my question for you. We're going to talk about dinosaurs tonight, but what is a dinosaur? But what is a dinosaur? That's actually kind of an important question to be able to answer as we start looking into a few things this evening and we try to learn about them. Anybody know what a dinosaur is? Any ideas? Yes, sir. Terrible giant lizard. That's what the word actually means. The word dinosaurus literally means big, terrible, scary reptile lizard. That's right. Anything specific about it that makes it a dinosaur? Yes. It's a reptile. That is exactly right. What are some characteristics of reptiles? Tell me something about reptiles. Scaly skin. I heard that. What else? Cold-blooded. They're ectothermic. That's right. They lay eggs, most of them. Never, that is exactly right. Looking at me like I'm in a zoo, that's right. <laughs> so let me ask you this then. Would an alligator be a dinosaur? Or a Komodo dragon? Or a box turtle? Are those dinosaurs? Who said that? You are right. They are not dinosaurs. You are exactly right. Are those things dinosaurs? No, they're not dinosaurs. So, but, but they're reptiles. So what makes the difference? Why does something get classified as a dinosaur compared to any and all other reptiles? 
It's in the way you walk. It's all in the way you walk. All other reptiles, alligators, show me how an alligator walks. Stick your arms out there. Show me how an alligator walks. Yeah, it walks like that, right? The arms out, and a turtle, how's a turtle walk? Yeah, its arms are straight out there like that. Okay, how, how's a lizard walk? His arms are out there like that. Exactly. That's not how a dinosaur walks, is it, though? No. They walk. Here it is. Here's how we tell everybody in BBS. Okay, everybody take your hands like this. Put them right back here. They walk upright on their legs. So a dinosaur is a reptile that walks how? Upright on its legs. See, they've got a hole. You can see right there on pebbles. Pebbles, the Albertosaurus, it's got a hole right here, and the leg comes straight up, makes a right angle turn, and goes whoop, right into the, into the pelvis there. It's got a hole there. The acetabellum is open. And so they walk upright on their legs, even on a four-legged one. Four-legged dinosaur. Name me a four-legged dinosaur. Stegosaurus. What? Brontosaurus, also known as Apatosaurus, Triceratops. All of those still walk on their back legs, their back legs are still upright. They come straight out of the hips, go down, and so they are still walking upright on their legs. So a dinosaur is a reptile that does what? Walks upright on its legs. Keep that right up here. We're going to be coming back to that in just a little bit. All right, there are lots of different classifications of them. There's these funny things about their hips. They have one of two style hips. One's called Lizard style hips, Soriskian, the other's bird style hips. I want you to remember which one's in particular, a particular one in that category. This one right here. See these guys? So T Rex right here. And what's this here? What is it? I heard it. It's a raptor. Okay. Which one? Yeah? Velociraptor. How big is a velociraptor? Stand up and show me how big a velociraptor is. About that big? Yeah, okay. Are you ready? Are you ready? A velociraptor is actually uh, this big. Size of a turkey. That's not how it was in the movie, though, was it? All right? That's not, no, in the movie, it's, it's this big, and it's faster than a Harley Davidson. I mean, no. Uh, yeah, velociraptor, that big. They wouldn't exaggerate for a movie, would they? See, what they're showing you is actually what's called uh, a Deinonychus, and it's the size of a Utah raptor. Let me look here. Ah, yes, one that'd be about this size. Okay, see, on this guy, this is Dromaeosaurus. All your raptors are in the Dromaeosaur family. His little, his little big, called the killer claw there, is about that big, and the Velociraptor is even smaller. Okay, so you, you like that? You can pass that around, let everybody see that. Okay. Now, don't think you can walk home with that because there are other little kids all the way at the other end who are waiting their turn to see it, okay? So, all right, you can pass that around. Let everybody get a chance to look at it. That's from, like, what would be called a Utah raptor or Dakota raptor. Those are the biggest of the raptors, okay? So, li 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 the velociraptor is that big, okay? They have which style hips? Lizard hips or bird hips? Lizard. Keep that right up here. Lizard style hips. Right now, they're, the others are in the other side. That they're not birds, obviously. You wouldn't look at a stegosaurus and think bird, would you? No. Okay. Same thing with the uh, like survey here. Our Edmontosaurus, okay, and a Parasaurolophus up there, and the Pachy kinds. We got Sandy, the Pachycephalosaurus over there, and the Ceratopsians. We have Gundy, the Triceratops. He's not here tonight. He had a previous engagement. So, um, which style hips do the raptors have the lizard style hips and of course we know they can get really big the reason this is important and i gotta spend just a few minutes on this and i would i used to not spend any time on this at all because this was something that we just laughed at and like nobody's really going to ever believe that are they well now everywhere i go all the church camps all the youth groups all of the vbs's Kids are coming up to me, and they automatically believe this wholeheartedly because this is what they're being taught in their institutions of education. 
If you were to go to the Chicago Field Museum or pretty much any other natural history museum, you may see a sign like this. It says, what's a dinosaur? Now, you already know. A dinosaur is a what? Reptile that does what? Walks upright on its legs. That's right. And so it says dinosaurs are reptiles and talks about that. That's great. But then you go around the corner and it says, by the way, birds are dinosaurs. Okay. Anybody see a problem with that? What's the problem with that? It's a bird, not a reptile. Do, do they have, are they covered in scales? No. Are they cold-blooded? No, they are warm-blooded. Do they have a three-chambered heart? No, they have four. Do they have, oh, their lung system, completely different? Their bone structure, completely different. The way the, the bones are arranged, completely different. Yet, if you go to the all-knowing Wikipedia, which, by the way, is just citing the latest academics, has the, si the sources cited, it says reptiles, crocodiles, are more closely related to birds than they are to lizards, and so we now classify birds as part of reptilia. How many of you knew that? It's been a while since you were in school, isn't it? You need to be aware of this. This is what's going on. Because they're being taught, when you see crocodile, you're supposed to look at that, hmm, not related to turtle or Komodo dragon. or what. And all these things are... Relatives of bird. And, and by the way, you look up bird. Birds evolved from, oh, what's the key here? What's this all about? Right there. What's that word there? Evolved. Evolution. Earlier, feathered dinosaurs, which, by the way, guess how many feathered dinosaurs we've ever found? The theropod group. The, thera the, ther ooh, the theropods. That's these guys, the raptors. Which style hips do they have? The lizard hips. Them and the, the sauropods, they're the only ones that have litter. All other dinosaurs have the bird hips. So I'm thinking, if I'm going to try to sell this story, I'm going to pick a dinosaur that has which style hips? The bird hips. But of all the dinosaurs they could pick, they picked like one of only two categories of dinosaurs that have the lizard hips instead. Is that just not the greatest thing? It's as if the Lord's like, you know, this 1% of dinosaurs, when he's creating them, I'm going to give them this style hips, the lizard style hips, and all the other ones, the bird ones, because I know someday, of all the ones they're going to pick, they're going to pick the ones with the lizard hips. I mean, is this just not, wow. Okay, so, here is why. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to tell you, I don't know. Listen now to how they defend this, okay? Are you ready? There's a guy named Jack Horner incredible paleontologist. He's so good that he was the main guy who advised Steven Spielberg for the making of the Jurassic Park movies, even on some the, the more recent ones, the Jurassic World ones as well. Brilliant guy. In fact, when it comes to paleontology and dinosaur stuff, he's usually my first go-to because I really like his approach to dinosaurs, except for one aspect of it. Well, maybe a couple of them, but this one in particular. Listen to how this is being taught, okay? We have discovered that dinosaur DNA and all di DNA just breaks down too fast. We're just not going to be able to do what they did in Jurassic Park. We're not going to be able to make a dinosaur based on a dinosaur. But birds are dinosaurs. Birds are living dinosaurs. We actually classify them as dinosaurs. We now call them non-avian dinosaurs and avian dinosaurs. So the non-avian dinosaurs are the big clunky ones that went extinct. Avian dinosaurs are our modern birds. So we don't have to make a dinosaur. So I already have them. I know you're, you're, as, you're as bad as the sixth graders, right? The sixth graders look at it and they say, no. You can call it you can call it a dinosaur, but look at the Velociraptor. The Velociraptor is cool. The chicken is not. So this is our problem, as you can imagine. The chicken is a dinosaur. I mean it really is. I mean you you can't argue with it because we you know we're the classifiers and we've classified it that way.
whatever they say, that's what it is. Yet you, you have to follow the science. Right? Which has taken on a whole different meaning in our culture, hasn't it? Wow. So I, I got to wrap this part up and get to the good stuff because this is just a waste of time, should be. But it's sadly, we had so if you go up to Sam Noble, they have pictures like this trying to completely re-articulate a chicken and a dinosaur to try to make them look similar, even though there are all kinds of differences and problems with that. Uh, one young person came up to me and said, yes, yes, but we learned about the Nanooksaurus. I'm like, the Nanooksaurus, that's got to be, okay, that was discovered in 06 up in Alaska, and because it was found in Alaska, they put on there all these feathers, oops, I went too far, they put all these uh, feathers on it, and he talked about how they found it with oh, this, set, this extra set of down underneath and a double layer of feathers and all this stuff to keep it warm during winter so it could regulate his body heat. I mean, he was dead serious. He could not believe I taught at VBS that dinosaurs didn't have feathers. He's like, we got all kinds of like the next word. So I was like, well, let's look it up. He's like, okay, let's look it up. We looked him up. You know how much of that fossil they found? And this is, by the way, this is a little insight about how a lot of dinosaurs are made. That brown part of the jaw, and that's it. That's usually about how much you find of a dinosaur when you find one. The vast majority of the time. And from that, they built that whole thing and covered it in feathers and said, this is science. Every time we find actual skin impressions of dinosaurs, guess what they're covered in? Scales, from head to toe. If we were to find a feather, it would look like that, never have. Instead, we find these little, uh, we, the one thing they have is a 3.6 centimeter piece of amber that has a little tail in it that has feathers on They said, there it is, there it is, we finally found a dinosaur with feathers, except you read the actual scientific paper and it said the feathers are pretty much the same as modern birds, not a dinosaur. Okay, and there are very good scientists, not Bible believers, evolutionary scientists who absolutely think that this is as crazy as it sounds. And they have shown that the same things they say are feathers on some dinosaurs are actually integumentary fibers, as in parts of the skin and the tissue have break, uh, broke down during fossilization. Because he said, by the way, I found the same thing. And they were like, what, what, what? I found feathers except it was on an ichthyosaurus, which is a marine reptile. And I also found them on all kinds of other things, including not only these dinosaurs, but dolphins. Now, how many dolphins have you ever seen covered in feathers? All right. So th there are very good scientific-based explanations, laboratory-based scientific explanations for these things they say are feathered dinosaurs and they're not really see all this has to do with our worldview when you look at a dinosaur what is your worldview because let me ask you this question if we go back to this book and guess where i always start see i want my worldview founded in this and it's always needed to be a little you know sharpened my worldview needs to be sharpened so guess what i always need to keep studying When I go back and I look at how God said he made everything, which where would I go to learn that? The Bible, Genesis chapter 1, he tells us what day would all the bird kinds have been made. The birds. What number day of history would they have been made? Anybody know? I see it back there. They're raising their hands. That's right. Day number five, 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 five. Day number five, all your water and wing creatures made on day number five. So let me ask you this question. This guy right here, this is Tylosaurus Pro Rigger. He is around 45 feet long. He's the largest Tylosaurus ever discovered thus far. He's in the Mosasaur family, if you ever heard of those, okay? He has these giant flippers. Giant flippers. Where would he spend most of his time, do you think? In the water. That's right. What number of day would his kind have been made? 
five, okay, let me ask you this. Is he a dinosaur? Think about it. Think about it. Connects it Oh, a dinosaur is a reptile that does what? Walks upright on its legs. Can he walk upright on his legs? No. So by definition, he's not a dinosaur. His technical designation would be marine reptile. Okay? Made on day number five there. By the way, they found him in the middle of Kansas. Mm-hmm. Let's see. To make a fossil, you need lots of mud brought by lots of very, and we find fossils over the whole planet, the entire planet. Isn't that interesting? Okay. To see if there's some dot, okay, dots being connected there, okay? This guy right here, Pteranodon. Pteranodon. Is that a dinosaur? By definition, is he a dinosaur? Shake your head like this. No, because he can't walk up around legs. That's right. So what is he? He's not a bird because he's a reptile to our best understanding. So you ready? Here's what he's classified as. Here's the scientific term for him. He is a flying reptile. There you go. All right. I know. That's very technical. So, okay. So what number of day would his kind have been made? Now, what number of day... Would dinosaurs have been made? Ah, on the sixth day of history, God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures after their kind, cattle, the word there is behemoth, and creeping things and beasts after their kind, and it was so. The words there in the Hebrew literally mean from the biggest to the smallest and everything in between. Does that leave anything out? Not really. So what would that include then? That would include the dinosaur kinds, the original created kinds, all right? So they're on day number six. So let me ask you this question. Which came first, the chicken or the dinosaur? (laughs) Biblically, biblical worldview, what's the answer? Chicken. So do you automatically understand the problem with a biblical worldview when they do this whole thing of dinosaurs getting feathers and then turning into birds? What do you automatically do with the first chapter of Genesis? You have to throw it away if you're going to accept that. See, there are only two worldviews out there, a biblical worldview and a non-biblical worldview. There are variations within it, but that's pretty much what you got. So what are you going to take your stand on? Upon what are you going to base your understanding of this world? So here would be the biblical worldview about these creatures. Created on what number day of history? Six, the dinosaurs on day number six. Who else is made on that day? What are their names? Adam and Eve. So they would have lived alongside of them all the way up until the day of the flood, about 1,656 years from creation to the flood. And then during the, what is Noah told coming on board the boat with him? Oh, thank you very much. What's Noah told is coming on the boat with him? Two of every kind of land animal, and then there's also all the winged ones that are going on there as well. What would that, by definition, include then? Dinosaurs. Okay? And then after that, what are all the animals supposed to do? Have babies, repopulate the earth, and so then... We have the biblical worldview of dinosaurs and things we should be able to check and go see if they support whether or not God's word is right. Well, first, let's answer the question, could they even fit on the boat? Can they get on the ark? Okay. You don't think they could fit on the ark? Do you know how big the ark was? About that big? It was gargantuan. It was huge huge okay if you ever are in the greater cincinnati area and get a chance to go see the ark encounter i recommend you go and actually see it and just get that perspective at least okay uh it's incredible just to get that perspective that one they built down there um at, by answers in genesis at the ark encounter but even then why do we think the dinosaurs can't fit on there Because the movies have shown us they're huge. By the way, the fossils show us they're huge as well. The thing is, though, what are they supposed to do when they get off the boat? 
What are all the animals supposed to do? Repopulate, reproduce. Somebody said one of the characteristics of reptiles are what do they do their whole lives? They keep growing. So the biggest dinosaurs, like the biggest crocodiles, are also what? The oldest. Are they going to be who you bring on the boat for repopulating the earth? No, they're not. I'm sorry, this is not a senior's cruise. I mean, Noah's the exception, he and his wife. Everyone else, you got to be of age that when you get off the boat, you've got to have as many years of reproduction as you possibly can. Now, that doesn't mean they brought babies on, because how many are allowed on? Just two, mama and daddy. They're going to soon be a mommy and a daddy. So they're not going to be babies. They have to be weaned, okay? But even the biggest dinosaurs, the average adult size of all the dinosaurs, according to uh, many surveys, is about the size of bison, buffalo, okay? That's the adult size. The average size of the juveniles of all the dinosaurs would be about the size of a sheep. According to the great work of Dr. Tim Clary in his book Dinosaurs that we have out there in the bookstore for you to check out later, um, he says there are about 60 dinosaur kinds. So 60 times two would be about how many? 120, and we're taking juveniles, so that way when they get off the boat, we can have lots of reproduction to replenish the species. We're talking about 120 sheep-sized animals. Can that fit on the boat? Yeah, they can have their own little corner. You can call it Jurassic Ark, whatever you want to do, okay? They can fit, no problem, all right? So, anybody else want to see another little fossil? Want to see another fossil? How about a T-Rex tooth? There you go. Now take that and pass that around. Let everybody else get a chance to look at that as well. Okay. T-Rex too. So they can fit on the boat. In fact, some of the best estimates are we're talking around 7,000 animals total, and you can get everything that was once alive that's now extinct and everything that's alive today through speciation after that, okay, and all the different breeds you get. So they can fit on the boat, no problem. Now then, when they get off the boat, they're supposed to repopulate. See, I used to be, as Robert said, history teacher. So now we're in the part that's my favorite part. I should be able to go back through history then, through the records of civilizations, and what should I expect to find if the biblical account is true? Dinosaurs. People's record of dinosaurs. What they saw, what they drew, what they portrayed. And I'm supposed to be looking for, what are dinosaurs? Reptiles that what? Walk upright on their legs. They're the only reptiles that walk upright on their legs. So notice the criteria I'm looking for. Am I looking for the word dinosaur in ancient civilizations? Shake your head like this. Show me you're still awake. Okay, good. All right, no. Because that word didn't come about until 1841 and wasn't published until 1842. When Sir Richard Owen's like, I need a fancier word than big scary reptile to talk about these things. And so he makes up the word dinosaurus, dinosauria, big scary reptile is what it means. What I'm looking for in other civilizations then is their word or description of big scary reptiles that what? Walk upright on their legs. Would your Bible maybe even have a word for that? Oh, yes. In fact, many civilizations even have a word that means big, scary reptile, such as, have you heard of that before? If you were to go to the Indianapolis Children's Museum, they have this specimen called Dracorex. It's in the Pachy family, Pachycephalosauria family, just like Sandy here. Say hi, Sandy. That's Sandy. Okay, this is Sandy, the Pachycephalosaurus. The sign says it's a new type of dinosaur that looks like a what? Dragon. Could you use that word and properly describe this creature right here? What do you think? So when they asked the question, is it a dragon or a dinosaur, my answer was yes, absolutely, 100%. So, your Bible has a word that means big, scary reptile. It's the word tanin. Often is translated as uh, monster, great creature. King James used to translate it as dragon. Used to have that in there pretty frequently. 
And so they're, they, you can see how they're listed throughout the passages, whether they're marine reptiles, land reptiles. We even have a different word for flying reptiles in the, in the Old Testament. It's the seraphs found in Isaiah 14 and Isaiah chapter 30. They're, so they're all in there, all listed. Fascinating. Job gets to see one in particularly. What was the name of his? The one specifically, two specifically, one's a dinosaur, one's not. First one is the behemoth. The description of behemoth is it's an herbivore that has the most incredible skeletal structure ever, including a massive what? Tail. Compares it to the cedars, like the cedars of Lebanon, Solomon used for constructing the temple. And he said it's first amongst God. It, God literally says this is the biggest land creature I've ever made. To date, what's the largest land creature that we know of that has ever walked the planet? What? Elephant? The, the big, oh, T-Rex is pretty big, a lot bigger than an elephant, yes. Is there anything bigger than T-Rex? What, what do you think? Megalodon. Yes, Megalodon. Okay, since you brought him up. There you go, Megalodon tooth. Just because you brought him up, there you go. You can pass that around. Okay, he dragged it out of me. Okay, so biggest, what, what, what do you got? Biggest land creature. A what? Oh, Stegosaurus, that's a big one, yes. A what? The long necks, yes, that's exactly right, the long necks. The fancy word for them are sauropods. Everybody say sauropod. Sauropod, long neck, long tail creatures. They are huge. We got the Apatosaurus down at Sam Noble. Its tail without any muscle or tissue or, or anything, five feet, 30 feet long. Five foot thick. That would, that, that's a lot better than the idea of a hippo. Absolutely. So the biggest one to date is the Patagot Titan in the Chicago Field Museum. That's me right there standing beside it. Biggest one to date that we know of, 122 feet long. Massive, massive bone structure. It matches the exa exactly. What should I expect to also find then in other civilizations? Guess what I find? You go to Asia, dating around 2000 B.C., in modern-day Iraq, you find these large, muscular creatures with long necks, long tails, walking how? How? Upright on their legs. And what are they doing with their necks? They're kind of interlocking them. That's interesting. You go to... Um, Asia, uh, you go from Asia down to Africa, into Egypt, and you have what's called the Narmer Plate. The first uh, king to rule over both Upper and Lower Egypt, he makes this nice little plate there, and it depicts these, uh, what are called serpentine creatures, long necks, interesting little tails, and they're walking how? Upright on their legs, and what are they doing with their necks? Interlocking them, okay? Let's go up to Europe. And to England, there's this place called the Carlisle Cathedral, there it is, where Bishop Bell is buried, and where he is buried, he has all these animals on there, and then there's this little bronze cast that's on there, and, and what do we see there? Next interlocking of two long neck, long tail creatures walking how? Upright on their legs. Hmm. Three different places, three different continents from three different time periods. And they have these large, long neck, long tail creatures walking upright on their legs. And not only do we have their depictions, but we have them interlocking their necks. A, a guy came up to me afterwards, he's like, you realize what we got there? And I'm like, well, yeah, we got sauropods on three continents. He's like, no, 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 we got more than that. I was like, what? He said, we've got depictions of observed behavior. He had to catch me as I about fell down. I was like, woo, that's exciting. That's exciting. All right, there's this other one called Leviathan. 
You're going to have to have me come back to tell you about that one. Oh, no, this is, sorry, that's a cliffhanger, all right. By the way, we had a new discovery of a fossil earlier this year that we think is the best candidate for Leviathan. It's really cool. So I'll tell you afterwards if you want to see it. So anyway, so here's the deal. You can go all across the world, and you'll find depictions from all the different continents, pretty much except Antarctica. Not a lot of people living down there to make depictions of dinosaurs. Here in Utah, you've got them in uh, Australia. I mean, the details even to these things and their depictions. We got skeletal structures, we got digestive systems, we've got that match up beautifully with all these things. You've got um, the Teprom Temple, where you have what looks like a stegosaurus that even as of 2017, we realize there's a second depiction on the inside that shows that it looks like it's been harnessed. That's very interesting. That's in Cambodia. You go up the same time up into China, and they have descriptions of, la- of dragon rears, dragon tamers, dragon feeders for the, for the emperor who is using them to harness them and use them to pull his chariot even. We have a written descript- description at the same time you have that depiction down there. You have Marco. Oh, good. There you go. Who goes to China 100 years later. And, oh, I'd love to spend a whole lot of time on this one. It's phenomenal. The details he gives of this incredible reptile creature, huge reptile creature that has these itty bitty arms, giant head, sharp teeth, said he could swallow a whole man. What is that? Sounds like a T Rex, doesn't it? The thing is, though, always look at the details. He says of this one that it has. How many claws? Anybody see that up there? Marco Polo's had three. T-Rexes have how many? Two. They've got two, okay? They've got two. And he gives the size of it. We're looking for something around 25 feet, theropod, those are the ones that have the big legs, little arms, and has how many claws? Three. Marco Polo's had three. Do we have anything like that in the fossil record? Some would say Marco Polo exaggerated, made up some of the things on his trips. He very well may have. But what an amazing coincidence that by accident, when he's just making this up, he happened to just stumble on, just by random chance, accidentally described an allosaurus in perfect detail. What are the odds? The, it just goes on. This one book that we have, it's probably my favorite book on the table, Dire Dragons, this researcher named Vince Nelson, he went around the, country, the world and gathered these depictions, came back, and then had a professional computer generation company make these dinosaurs. All he asked them what, to do was make them this color and put them in this position, but I want you to make them accurate based on our understanding from the fossils. Based on our knowledge of their anatomy. And it's a whole book full of this. Question. How do you do that when we really don't start excavating dinosaur fossils around the world until mostly the 1800s and start reconstructing them? And we don't have natural history museums to go to until the Mid, late, late 1800s, early 1900s. Logically, rationally, what's the only explanation for all these accurate depictions of large reptiles walking upright on their legs? What's the only scientifically based explanation for that? They saw them with their own eyes, exactly. So the evidence supports what? The evolutionary worldview or the biblical worldview. Someone may ask, well, where are they at today? Well, reptiles like certain types of climates. And the climates after the flood, not very good. According to all the scientific models, again, they're just models, based on the conditions of what we understand took place during the flood, guess what results after that? Ice Age. Peaks about 500 years after that is finally over about 700 years after that. Is that good conditions for dinosaurs? It's going to severely impact the locations in which they can live. So here's the cool thing about that. When you go back through history and you start charting 
which, which they've got pretty good evidence for this, the places where we, throughout the history where you have warm spells and cold spells and warm spells and cold spells and warm spells naturally occurring throughout history. Mm-hmm. Okay. Guess what all of these appearances of the dinosaurs are matching up with? Where the climates are warm enough during that time period from when those would be places where they could live at that time. And it's matching up beautifully. It's ongoing research that we keep doing to, to try to get all this figured out so that we can see how long they survive. And about that Bishop Bell one that I showed you, that's one of the last depictions we have of them. We seem to get fewer and fewer and fewer as we get through history until pretty much time of the pilgrims, time of uh, they're completely gone, the last descriptions we have of them about the time of Columbus the very last few that were still around. Now, you hear rumors about all kinds of stuff all the time, you know, but you can go study those wherever you like. But the last thing I want to show you, and then we're done, okay? Okay, well, I'm going to show you one last thing. That's the historical stuff. That's the biblical stuff. Let me show you a little laboratory science stuff. According to the evolutionary worldview, dinosaurs went extinct 65, technically now it's 66.44 something, billion, uh, million years ago, million years ago. The Bible gives us a history of roughly around 6,000 years. Okay, that's, that's what we get when we add up everything it gives us. So, the whole idea of the dinosaurs and all that stuff can't possibly be true, and the Bible be true at the same time, if the evolutionary worldview has good, solid science behind it. Well, they keep finding things in science that isn't helping the evolutionary case, but instead absolutely supports the biblical. Last video I'm going to show, and then we're going to wrap it up. Here we go. Check this out. You, you remember a guy named Jack Horner? Guy helped with the uh, Jurassic Park movies I mentioned earlier. Check this out, what happened when they discovered a certain T-Rex in 2000 and then published the results in 2005. Horner's practice of breaking dinosaur bones apart and sending the insides to Mary Schweitzer has landed the two of them at the center of one of the biggest controversies paleontology has seen in years. It started back in 2000 with a series of coincidences. A member of Jack's team, Bob Harmon, wandered away from a dig site one day to eat lunch and noticed a small piece of bone sticking out of the side of a 50-foot cliff. I could tell pretty much what it was from where I was sitting, that it was a T-Rex metatarsal. How was it sticking out? You mean it was the side, here's a cliff, and it was like a little jutting out? Yep, exactly. He got a folding chair, and he stacked it on these rocks right there. And you can see that this is on the sheer side hill of a cliff. Here he this is sh- not possible. No, is he attached to anything? No, he's not. That's Bob. Jack named the the T-Rex B-Rex in Bob's honor and made the decision to dig it out. But this was under 50 feet of rock. I mean, this was in a terrible place. There was no road to it. There was no access to it. And so for the next three summers, we sent out climbing crews, people that could repel down cliffs with jackhammers. I mean, it was a horrendous undertaking. The site was so remote that bones had to be lifted out by helicopter. But the giant cast containing B. rex's thigh bones was too heavy. The chopper couldn't get it off the ground. So after all that excavating, Jack gave the order to cut one of B. rex's femurs in two. One of these bones. Now that was heartbreaking. Big no, well, not really. I mean, get a chance to see inside. He shipped the bone fragments that fell out to Mary Schweitzer. So she calls you up and she, she says... calls up and says, <gasps> we have medullary bone. Oh. Now, this had to be thrilling. Yes, very very exciting. And that wasn't all. What happened next happened by mistake. Mary put some fragments of the bone in acid to dissolve away the outermost layer of mineral. But the acid worked too fast, and all the mineral dissolved away. Being a fossil, there should have been nothing left. But there was, and it was elastic, like living tissue. This is the piece. (gasps) No. She showed us video she took under the microscope. That's really what happened? Yes. That's the dinosaur bone? Without mineral now. That's what was left. It looked like the soft tissue she would have expected to find if it had been modern bone. 
This was impossible. This bone was 68 million years old. So you impossible. see this. Impossible. And you think, what? You I see, didn't want to tell anybody. <laughs> Why? Why? You'd not? be ridiculed, yes. right? And so I, I said to my technician, okay, do it again. I don't believe it. And yet, in sample after That's sample, the they were there. Leg. Things that look suspiciously like flexible, transparent blood vessels. She finally mustered the courage to tell Jack. She said she dissolved the bone away and there were blood vessels. And, you know, I was like, shocked. I mean, how could that be? How could that be? That's right. How could that be? The things Mary was finding inside dinosaur bones. Look at that. Blood vessels and even what seemed to be intact cells pose a radical challenge to the existing rules of science. Oh, that organic material really? can't possibly survive even a million years, let alone 68 million. Well, that is Mary, true. Jack, and their team published their B-Rex findings in a series of papers in the journal Science and were promptly attacked. They came after them vehemently. This is the leading guy for the Jurassic Park movies. And they're like, and they attacked that. And she's like, well, come look at it yourself. She published it over and over and over again. And then later on, Harvard sequenced it. They confirmed it, absolutely. This is it, this is B-Rex, that's the leg. There it is, there's the soft tissue, there's the, the blood vessels, collagen, hemoglobin, red blood cells, and they just keep finding it more and more and more. In 2005, they, pub they did a, so the, the proceedings of the Royal Society to be, and gobs of stuff. Look at all the dinosaurs being listed. It's almost like, hey, uh, you got a dinosaur? Let's break it open. Because they're finding this stuff over and over again. I checked. Before I came, last re reported, 116 peer review articles have been published, two more already this year, all containing original biomaterial in all of these ancient fossils that, according to the rules of science, can they last millions of years? No. But what about under certain preservation Condition, conditions when you fossilize something with lots of mud brought by lots of very say only a few thousand years ago is it scientifically possible then that material might still be there yes see in all the stuff we've seen over and over again in history in science in archaeology, in all the different fields of study, do they support or do they negate God's Word? They absolutely support it. The, the, the theme verse, if you want to call it that, for our ministry is John 3, 12. When Jesus is speaking to Nicodemus, who is one of the highest in all of academia of his time, one of the highest educated guys there was, and he's speaking to him about the simple truths of God's word. And he's like, ah, I'm not getting it. And he's like, if I'm telling you the earthly things and you don't believe, how will you believe when I tell you the heavenly things? See, Dr. G. Thomas Sharp started this ministry in little noble Oklahoma 32 years ago because he was a science teacher. And he was seeing all these young people from churches walking away from the faith because they were looking at the earthly things in the halls of academia and being told, here's what we are teaching you through a non-biblical worldview. Guess what happened to their belief in the spiritual things? Jesus literally has given us the challenge. You go check this out. Anything this book says. People, places, locations, events, times, uh, circumstances, uh, great events in history, scientific claims. It's not a science textbook, but it sure makes a lot of scientific claims when you look at it. And he says, if you find out that any of that is not right, you do actual good, real study research, find out he says, just, just toss that away because it's not worth your time. But if and when you do go check it out and you find out that all these things you can go see turn out to be absolutely true, the things you can see, then guess what else you can believe? The things we can't yet see. Jesus never asked us to have blind faith. He's challenged us to study 
and see that he is real. And he is here with us today to guide us through this cursed world. See, death, disease, pain, suffering, that's not how he made it. That's a result of sin. See, if these guys died 65 million years ago, what does that say about the consequence of sin? What changed in the world when Adam and Eve sinned? No. No. Jesus physically died and physically rose again. That's an historic fact, one of the most attested to historical events. I can prove that event in history far better than almost any other event in history. So when he tells us that he's loved us, and he's here to get us through this life, and if you repent and are immersed into him, clothed with life, your sin problem, death problem are taken away, and you have a future, oh, it's going to be good. Are you going to be there? Who are you going to bring with you? Father, that's our challenge tonight. How we've seen your word is remarkable. It stands true through the test of time, no matter the assaults that come against it. Nothing can stand against it. So may we take our stand upon it. May we be steadfast and not go out to the world with all these scientific facts and blah, blah, blah. May we simply take the love of Jesus. And then when people have questions, we can begin to walk them through how your word is so solid. And when this earth is so shaky and there are no good answers and there seems to be no hope, there's Jesus. And his tested and tried and true, his word. May we study it, may we learn it, and may we be touched by it and impacted by it in such a way we can't help but want to tell others. And so may your kingdom prosper here in this place as Jesus is lifted high and glorified. May the world see Jesus through us is our prayer, and we pray it in the name of our Creator and Savior. And those who would testify of Jesus said, Amen. Okay, aren't you glad you were here tonight? I get it. Thank you very much, Ryan. And uh, we, we look forward to, to having, uh, having him back again. I think it'd be great to, to hear more and learn more uh, to build our, our faith up. Uh, one suggestion, though, it came from, uh, what grades are you in? First grader? First grade girl would like equal time. She said, dinosaurs are for boys. <laughs> Girls want mermaids. So, so do you have a lesson on mermaids? Maybe that'd be. <laughs> no, it was good. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you for being here. Uh, and, um, and hope you'll stay visit. And is there anything you want to say about the, the resource table, book? We've got uh, little kids sources from, I mean, the littlest ages all the way up. Uh, we've got just good basic, all kinds of information. We have specified stuff about dinosaurs. We've got highly technical stuff. If you're wanting that and get into that, such as um, ancient and fossil bone college of remnants by Brian Thomas, Ph.D. in paleobiochemistry. He has specifically worked on all the soft tissue stuff and the carbon-14 dating of fossils and Guess what he believes? That God's word is absolutely true based on the science. So we've got the whole range of all kinds of stuff. Just good general reading from the littlest to the, to the biggest. I don't know how big you need to be for a book. But, you know, 
So uh, we, we got it all. Just come back there and check it out. So thank, thank you, you again, Ryan, for uh, for being here. His family's here as uh, as well, and we just uh, wish them the best uh, on on the trip uh, coming up as as they're uh, heading out of state. So be sure and take time to look at the uh, resource table uh, out there in our foyer as well as the things here. Remember, uh, there's some signs here, please do not touch. So uh, remember that. So uh, we're going to be dismissed uh, with, with a word of prayer. And then uh, again, you can look, you can talk, ask questions, go out to the resource table, visit with one another. And uh, we'll see you Sunday morning at uh, 9.15. Let's pray together. Father, again, thank you for a wonderful evening. And we just uh, ask your blessings on this ministry, on Ryan and his family. And uh, Father, uh, we just pray for more and more to believe that you created this world. And that you gave every good gift we have. And that you gave the greatest gift of all, Jesus Christ. And it's through him that we can have that forgiveness of sins and that hope of the great life to come. And Father, we just thank you. And we ask your blessings as we leave this evening. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You're dismissed.